G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Uh, today we are doing a little bit of a different video. I have recently come across some interesting statistics related to the age demographics of AFL lists as we head into the 2024 season. Real off-season content for you, but I always find this stuff a little bit interesting. And looking at age demographics for teams can be an interesting exercise because it allows you to plot a little bit in terms of theoretically, which teams might be on the verge of rapidly improving and which teams are potentially set up for more sustained success. And by contrast as well, which teams are potentially gonna fall off a cliff soon. In some cases, we, we kind of already have a good idea uh, if you've been following the AFL relatively closely, which clubs are more likely to be successful over the next three or four years than others. But regardless, it's nice to have some of these things confirmed by statistics. So what I've found here is, it's actually a post from Big Footy. So I'll shout out a guy called Jupes on the West Coast Eagles board for finding this data and he's pulled it from FootyWire apparently. Now I'm not 100% sure if he made the graph himself or if it is actually spat out by FootyWire, but FootyWire is a great resource. I use it all the time and I haven't been able to replicate that same chart. So I'm not too sure if he made it himself. But what we're looking at in today's video is a very superficial way of looking at AFL lists. I'll grant you that. This is a very one dimensional way of analyzing lists and basically it's broken up AFL lists into how many young players under 21 clubs have how many players are pre-prime, so like 22 to 25 or something like that, how many players are in their actual prime, and how many players on a list are seasoned veterans. So again, this is only one way of looking at a list, but it doesn't mean there aren't interesting outcomes to come out of looking at it anyway. What I will say is that this chart doesn't speak to the amount of quality players in each section, which is obviously really, really important, but you can't really plot all of that in one individual chart. So like I said, it's a superficial way of trying to analyze a list and how well-placed teams are going forward. But nonetheless, we're gonna look at it together and we're gonna run through some takeaways in my opinion, and then you can let me know in the comments what your takeaways are. So as you can see here, we have the uh, the chart and it is ranked by, I think the, the team with the most under 21 talents is at the top, that's the West Coast Eagles. And you can see there's a little bit of a chart up the top right to help you out as well. So perhaps, you know, as some guiding points as well, you could say that, you know, the bigger the green and yellow portions, so the players in their prime or seasoned veterans, you could say uh, superficially that that club is placed for the here and now quite well. I think that's fairly logical. That being said, the bigger the yellow section is, I would argue that more vulnerable a list is because that's, you know, a whole chunk of veterans on the list means that obviously when retirements happen, you might slide down the ladder. The bigger the purple section, which is the under 21 talents, uh, that in theory, the bigger that is, the more likely a club is likely to struggle in the short term because they've got a lot of youth on the list. And it might also indicate if they've got a lot of youth on the list, they might be rebuilding and therefore giving games to younger players, which will result in less wins usually. The bigger the blue section, the more likely a club is in theory of short-term improvement. So that's players just in front of their prime who are still you know, improving at a reasonable rate in between year to year. And when they hit their prime, obviously going to improve in the uh, short term. And another takeaway is like the bigger the green and the yellow section, while I said that that club is well-placed for the here and now, I'd say that if the green section is big, as well as the yellow section, you could argue as well they're set up for sustained success. So we'll go through the actual list now. Now it's kind of a fair amount of data to try and take in at once. So uh, the way I looked at it is, if you kind of superficially, of course, if you flip around uh, the, the list order of what we're seeing there and pretend it's the reverse order of the ladder, that was the first thing I did to see if there were any interesting outliers there. So like I said, if you look at it from reverse order and assume that the top four or five teams there is the bottom four, uh, the bottom four is similar. So that, that makes sense in theory because it has the most young players on the list. Uh, the exception there is Fremantle te technically finished fifth last, but they have, uh, they're have they in the bottom four in theory on this chart. If you look at the other end of the list, Collingwood, Carlton and Brisbane are towards the bottom, and that makes sense because all of those teams made it to the final four during the final series. Where my eyes were drawn initially was probably to the Gold Coast Suns, and they have very big green and blue portions, and that indicates that they should be up or set up well for sustained competitiveness but they did finish bottom four. So I thought that's kind of interesting takeaway. They're technically in a, in a position to be able to compete in the here and now and finish bottom four. Again, it's just kind of confirming this theory we had probably that Gold Coast underachieved this year. At least that's my opinion. To me, I also got, got from it that Adelaide are probably punching above their weight given they have so much youth. They're obviously just been through a rebuild and still kind of at the back end of that. But in my opinion, they were would have been a very, very worthy finalist this year. Obviously, there was controversy. They probably should have made the finals anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, considering how good they're playing, they're, they're actually punching above their weight in terms of their list demographic, I would argue. 
Now, GWS made the final four, and while I thought, you know, they kind of rely on uh, a very experienced midfield outfit and some really gun veterans, but along with North Melbourne, they have the two biggest emerging talent section, which that it was kind of news to me. I didn't really see GWS as having a lot of players in their pre-prime as about to explode, but that was something I got out of it. They're actually more well-placed than I had realized. Now, one thing this kind of confirms that we already kind of knew is that Geelong's veteran yellow section is far bigger than its player, its green section, which is players in their prime. And this is just an example of a club that should, in theory, face a bit of a drop-off soon. We know they have so many star veterans that are slowly being phased out, but they did actually have a lot of more under-21 prospects than I realized, which indicates that Geelong, as we knew, already knew this and have been working to rectify that. Again, it doesn't fully explain like how good are these under-21 prospects. It's a superficial way of looking at it, but at least you can argue that Geelong are clearly making moves to try and regenerate the list with some youth. They also kind of have the benefit of being able to trade their way out of it because players want to play for Geelong. And in theory, Geelong could sort of bridge the gap between their, their next premiership team and the one in 2022 by attracting top level talents. The other thing as well, Essendon have a large chunk of this list in the prime of their career. And we kind of should have really seen that coming when they traded in you know, three players in their prime. And I presume Goldstein is in the yellow section of this list because he's a veteran. But this really indicates now that Essendon, in terms of the list demographic, while they have some quality youth on the list, there is this is the time to perform well. Some other interesting points I got from this, obviously I'm an Eagles fan, and I couldn't help but notice the West Coast now has the most under-21 prospect, prospects in the league. Uh, now, this is not me reframing a superficial uh, data list and try and make it seem like West Coast is the best in the league at anything. Uh, but what I do think as a takeaway, this kind of demonstrates three years of work West Coast have done now to try and rectify their list demographic. And, you know, there are still comments in the media being made about how West Coast haven't started their rebuild. So I think they can have a day off, the people who are saying that. Uh, Hawthorne and North Melbourne, again, by contrast, this is not a surprise, but they have a lot more in the emerging talent section than someone like West Coast. Not a shock, really. We know that Hawthorne have been rebuilding for a few years now. North Melbourne have obviously been going through a more ongoing process. But the takeaway there is both of them are more well-placed than West Coast to move up the ladder in the short to medium term if you're banking on linear improvement, which obviously football doesn't always work that way. But North Melbourne are much more well-equipped than West Coast in theory to improve in the short term. There's outliers to that. West Coast still had a lot of injured veterans on the list that could come back and improve in the short term, but not necessarily the long term. The other interesting takeaway is I think people probably still continue to be surprised at how young Fremantle is. Uh, their rebuild has been going on for a long time now. They did bounce up into the finals, uh, but to fall away to fifth last, obviously not a great result, but it does indicate that they've got a lot of players about to hit their prime. And uh, I would argue, while this list doesn't say it, that some of the talent they've got there is really top quality. A lot of it, like Sarong, Young, and Amos, three that come to mind as being quite top end. Obviously, retention has been an issue for Fremantle over the last uh, eight years or so or whatever it's been. And if they can improve on that, they're gonna be very well placed. The other points I'll make, there's not something to be said for absolutely every club on the list, but I did kind of notice that St Kilda and the Western Bulldogs have quite mature lists. From my observation though, over the last handful of years, both of these clubs have drafted well. That's kind of opinion. With the Bulldogs, obviously they've benefited a little bit from a combination of father-son and NGA. Obviously they got to pick one out of their NGA prospect in Jamara Hagen, and then Sam Darcy as a father-son too, and then Jordan Croft too. But they also did well to draft Sanders. So I think they're actually better placed longer term than this, this chart would necessarily suggest. St Kilda, in addition to having, well, taking good picks in my opinion, I think they've drafted well certainly in the last three drafts. And they've also had some success with their NGA where uh, Machido Owens and Windhager have become quite good players, particularly Machido Owens, despite you know being drafted a little bit later. So again, to summarize, like this, this is one simple way of looking at uh, list demographics, but I still thought there were some interesting takeaways from that. But I probably missed something. Again, there's a lot of data being thrown at you at once. Um, so by all means, let me know in the comments section your opinions. As always, guys, I appreciate you watching the channel. I appreciate you being subscribed and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.